priest and a theologian, a Catholic priest, a theologian. Um, and uh, I live in Madrid in Spain, having lived in lots of different countries, Brazil, Chile, Bolivia, Mexico, United States, as well, of course, as my, my homeland, England. How, how we say that? I've been a, a, an out gay man as a, uh, as a priest for a long time. Um, uh, with all sorts of adventures uh, to to tell uh, regarding regarding the ups and downs of that, when I was nine, um, uh, I was told by a, a, another boy at school, as one was in those days, what what a queer was, and in those days, queer was not a a chic uh, word as it is now. In those days, queer was a very nasty word. And I instantly knew that I was one. Um, and in fact, you know, it seems bizarre to say so. At this, I was almost instantly thrilled that there was a word to describe people like me. I finally came out when I was 18. Um, but not because I was, if you like, confident, but because I knew I had to be honest, even though I had no basis of confidence. I was from a, a very conservative evangelical family. Um, and... I don't know whether uh, you know, whether your audience, I imagine your audience is aware of these things, but very often the you know the the rigidity of teaching can be even stronger and harsher in the evangelical world than in the Catholic world, um, and the notion of being an abomination and everything being according to biblical law and hell being very much round the corner um, was very very strong. Um, so. The realization that there was something warmer and more relaxed, I think, about the relationship between God and creation, as shown by my Catholic uh, friend, was the beginnings of uh, my of my conversion to, uh, to to Catholicism. The Church at that time was curiously in quite a similar place to it where it is now. Um, you know, now with Francis, in one sense. Well, we've moved ahead now, but at the beginning of Francis, it was as though we had gone back to the end of Paul VI. Um, it, we hadn't yet had the 35 years of going backwards, which were given us by John Paul. Uh, we had basically a massive, you know, break put on everything. A whole lot of things were forbidden to be talked about. So things became much, much, much uh, more difficult in the in the religious uh, order, both in in England and in the, uh, the countries that I was in. I was openly gay. This was uh, because, as I said, because this didn't seem to be particularly odd at the time, at least in in some of the contexts I was. The downs are, of course, that you have a, an ecclesiastical mechanism that is basically run by the closet. Um, uh, with a very large proportion of senior clergy who are closeted gay men, and of course, and many of them are don't wish to be cruel or nasty at all, but they're not prepared to stand stand up for what is true. Uh, they just want a quiet life, um, want to be so called prudent or obedient, um, don't want to question the teaching of the church, uh, even though they themselves don't live it and know that it's wrong. What's sadder is the number of uh, self, self-hating uh, and really very tortured um, homophobic clergy, especially high clergy. There are who are people who everyone knows are gay except perhaps themselves. Um, and these are the ones who have the strongest need to punish and to weed out and to attack. That's going to stay the way it is until people are able to talk rationally about what is true in this field, rather than playing games, trying to say, oh, well, there is this awful teaching, but we'll dance around it as long as we all pretend together. And if we play nice with each other, it'll be okay. Of course, we can't tell the lay people that it's nonsense, because then we'll be going against the teaching of the church. So we create a nice safe space for ourselves, except that we can't really create a safe space because there's always one or two self-haters amongst us who are going to try to use this issue. So, you know, it's a system of mutual blackmail, basically, emo mutual emotional blackmail. That's, uh, it means that they can't reach out and tell the truth to young people who need to be told the truth so that they can grow in good conscience and become 
sane, balanced adults who are capable of living sane, balanced lives rather than furtive, guilty, etc., etc. I got sent a letter in Latin saying, uh, you know, a lot of incomprehensible things, um, but theoretically in the name of the Holy Father. Um, in nominum, in nominem sumum pontifico, I don't know, all of that stuff in Latin. Um, anyhow, basically saying that I was uh, uh, not to preach or um, celebrate or hear confessions or anything like that. Um, so I was in, in the official language, I think they used to call it lay size, reduced to the lay status. Uh, now I think they try to, but they try not to be so rude to lay people, and now they call it dismissal from the clerical status. Well, uh, two months later, I was sitting in, in my flat in Madrid, and the phone rings with a hidden number, and the voice said, This is Pope Francis. And so I said, You're kidding. I said, I said, no, I, I said Really? He said, no, just kidding, son. <laughs> in, in Spanish, in Spanish, he says, soy el Papa Francisco. ¿En serio? No, hijo, en broma. <laughs> uh, just kidding. I bet it was him, uh, you know, it was uh, recognizably his voice. He'd read the letter, so he went through it, and he said, I want you to walk with great interior freedom, following in the spirit of Jesus, and I give you the power of the keys. Do you understand? I give you the power of the keys. It still hasn't resolved, if you like. I still don't belong to anything. I still... Uh, it's like he said, okay, in giving you wings, fly. But still, there's no, no tree that I can yet uh, land in. But maybe that will happen one day. Um, patches are breaking out all over the place. Uh, bishops are talking to to lay people, lay people finally are just getting on with life, being really quite confident and straightforward and organizing groups, and, uh, making in themselves known to the bishops. The bishops are often too frightened, but little by little, even quite conservative bishops are saying, yes, this is really too silly. Um, uh, let's, uh, let's see if we can talk about this in a more, more grown-up way. Even a good number of priests and bishops are just not prepared to put up with uh, this way of talking any longer. In other words, at last, people are no longer frightened by the old definition. They realize that the old definition is false. The difficulty is that in order to protect its moral teaching, the church needs a fake definition of who gay and lesbian people are. It needs us to be defined negatively from a presupposition of intrinsic corporal heterosexuality. And one of the reasons for that is that that argument in the Middle Ages seemed to match with how they understood the Bible. But we now know that the Bible passages that are used against uh, gay people uh, don't mean anything to do with what we call homosexuality. And curiously, at this stage, even the Vatican Biblical Com Com Commission realizes that it doesn't have anything to do. <laughs> in other words, when it comes to the biblical material, uh, the Catholic Church has actually got, got increasingly relaxed about its realization that these passages cannot be read in, the, in this way um, properly. That is bad Bible reading. Since the 1950s, of the, so in the last century, was that there is no pathology that is intrinsic <coughs> to being gay or lesbian. In other words, that we are as screwed up as straight people and in exactly the same ways as straight, straight people. And there's no particular way to suggest who is going to be more or less screwed up and in what way. <laughs> uh, in other words, our sexual orientation is not part of our screwed up, screwed upness. <laughs> Though, of course, as in the case of all of us, as in the case of straight people, uh, we are screwed up in how we live it out. And we have to learn to become less screwed up as we live it out, and that normally and healthily, the way of, of being humanized in this is a learning process. <laughs> Same-sex couples recognize that their married life is a blessing and seek to bless God for it with their friends by having liturgies of blessing. And that, of course, those people who know them, including the priests and bishops who know them, think, yes, this makes perfect sense. These people are blessing each other. They have become a blessing to their friends. Let us bless God for this. <laughs>